Hello, everyone, and welcome to the September 1922 um, Levitt Lectureship. I'm particularly pre pleased to introduce this Levitt Lectureship as it's embedded as a subset of a larger Gary Melton professorship that's going on here on campus for the next, well, for the last, let's say for a short week, um, we're doing things Gary Melton. And I was very pleased when uh, Dr. Krugman invited us, me and us, to join the Kemp Center and others in um, creating this event. Gary Melton um, is someone that Dick will talk about in more detail in just a moment, but he lived here for a while. I had the privilege of meeting him and knowing him and becoming introduced to his magnificent research and ideas having to do with um, a strategy for protecting children and preventing neglect and abuse by strengthening communities, which comports very well with something I and we are seriously interested in doing in the Department of Family Medicine. Uh, it's part of, it's part of the, actually the centerpiece of our um, of our uh, community efforts to uh, strengthen community and primary care's place within communities. Um, but this, this talk today for the next hour and a half is the Levitt lecture part of this, and it has to do with primary care and family medicine and our place in that universe of trying to protect children and prevent um, bad things from happening to children, uh, which I happen to think is the best investment we can make in the health of our nation. The, the Levitt Lectureship arose when uh, Lewis Levitt, who was born in 1897 and practiced as a general practitioner in Denver for 40 years, when he left an endowment for a professorship to the Department of Family Medicine. Uh, we have had 100 Levitt lecturers over the course of that time, some of whom are very distinguished. I think among the most distinguished of our Levitt lecturers are those we have today, and we have two. Just as much of the audience is joining us electronically, so is half our speaker panel, uh, Jill Corbin, was uh, wishing and hoping she could be here, but is indisposed to travel and is gonna be presenting her part of this um, virtually. Uh, we won't be able to see her, but you will know she's there when she begins to speak. Jill is, a, um, is an anthropologist at Case Western Reserve University and has been involved in child research and um, uh, child abuse and neglect research and advocacy and policy work for many years. She's actually a co-author of a book series that uh, she and Dick are working on to get, have been working on uh, together. She, let me just put it like this. She wins awards and she writes papers and people invite her to be on panels and she's great. She has the anthropologist perspective, so she looks at the cultural context very closely when thinking about communities and their uh, regard for and protection of children. Our other speaker is Dick Krugman. Unless you've been living under a rock, everybody here knows who um, Dr. Krugman is. He was the dean of this College of Medicine and the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs for 25 years. At the time of his retirement, the longest sitting dean in the US, he hired me. So I have to say nice things about Dick. <laughs> he recruited me to this place. As it turns out, concurrent with his work on um, uh, behalf of this College of Medicine, Dick was the editor in chief of the journal Child Abuse and Neglect, an international journal. He continued to do scientific and scholarly work on child abuse. He was the director of the Kemp Center here prior to his becoming the dean and vice chancellor. And as the minute he stopped 
being the dean, he went back to what he really likes doing the most, which is advocating for and researching and uh, working for the protection of children so that they can get a good start in this nation and in this world. He's an internationally recognized authority on child abuse and neglect and maltreatment. And it is a real privilege to have him as a Levitt speaker. So with that, I'm gonna get out of your way, Dick, and let you do the rest of this damage. Thank you, Frank. Okay, he was one of the better recruitments. Um, thank you uh, all very much. Uh, Jill, uh, I'm a, uh, are you off mute? Because I can't see you, and I just want to make sure I can hear you. Yes. I'm glad. I can I, see me on the screen, but you can't? I, I, I'm glad you can see me. But I, I know what you look like, but, but, and I know your voice, but I can't see you. So we're just going to play this okay. through. Uh, as, and... Uh, I'm sorry Jill's not here. We are grateful to this opportunity, to the department and to Frank and Linda and everyone else who helped us, uh, Robert, with this process. I, th this is a, gr a great opportunity for us. And Gary, uh, who was, we recruited to the faculty here um, with his wife, Robin, who is here somewhere, I saw her walk in. There she is, uh, up up there. <clears throat> Gary, uh, when asked when he asked me uh, when he came, where should I get my primary care? Uh, I sent him directly to the AF Williams uh, Center, and he was involved uh, with his care at AF Williams uh, for the years he was here, and uh, he got terrific care. And we had long conversations, he and I, about. Um, what family medicine could be doing uh, in this area um, that at least so far we hadn't seen. So Jill and I decided on this uh, topic. I, it, it, she, and by the way, she, I'm pretty acerbic uh, and she modulates uh, what I said. So I won't tell you what our original uh, title was, but this one is really much nicer. Uh, <laughs> And that is that we believe family medicine is positioned to best address maltreatment if only it would and you would. Um, disclosures are always important. Um, I, I'm chair of the board of the National Foundation to End Child Abuse and Neglect. Many of you have no idea what that is, uh, but it's a four-year-old uh, national organization uh, that I confess uh, I co-founded with a former patient of mine, Lori Poland, uh, who back in 1983, when I'd been at the Kemp Center for two years, uh, was a three-year-old who was kidnapped, sexually abused, and left in an outhouse uh, up by uh, Chief Hosa at exit 253 on uh, I-70. Uh, Lori is now uh, 41 a mother of three, a, a mental health therapist. Uh, she has her licensed uh, professional counseling degree. Uh, and when she asked me after I was dean, what do you want to do? What are you going to do next? I said, well, I got to get to Belgium uh, because they they did do child abuse differently and I want to study that. And uh, I also think we need something like the March of Dimes for child abuse because there is and has been no national organization that it wants to advocate for research, training, prevention uh, of child abuse and neglect in the United States. And it's about the only health area that I know of that doesn't have such a group. Uh, and every other area that does have a group, every organ of the body, uh, and every adult and pediatric disease that does have a 501c3 is a lot better now uh, than it was 50 years ago when I started in medicine. And child abuse is pretty stuck. Um, and so she said, I'd like to help. And I said, uh, terrific. I've never really operationalized anything in my life. Uh, every success 
I had as dean was because Lily Marks, other competent women, and a few good men were working with me. Uh, and so Gloria is now the CEO and I'm chair of the board of this foundation. We're four years in. And by the way, Sunday morning, there's a walk on this campus uh, because the advocacy group we're trying to look for are the adults who uh, either know of someone in their family or themselves have experienced abuse, gotten through it, uh, but of course, never talked about it because uh, we don't talk about those things. Jill has nothing to disclose unless something's come up in the last hour. Nothing's come up, right, Jill? Okay, we right. gotta come up. Right. I won't do that again. So we have objectives. Um, I want to briefly uh, get you to understand the history of pr the primary care role in child abuse and neglect. Uh, understand what family medicine and other primary care providers role should be in prevention. Uh, understand the impact of ACEs, uh, adverse childhood experiences, as well as protective factors on families and communities and understand the impact of neighborhood and community on maltreatment and its prevention. <clears throat> this uh, slide, uh, and I, I assume people on Zoom can see the slide. Uh, uh, this is Gary, uh, and uh, we picked out only four of his publications. There are, uh, it, it would fill boxes and boxes and boxes. Uh, but the protecting children from abuse and neglect uh, was a background, background papers and a book for work that the U.S. Advisory Board on Child Abuse and Neglect did. Uh, and Gary was really the uh, moral compass and uh, uh, really one of the, the prime uh, author of at least uh, 1.5 of uh, those reports and certainly the Neighbors Helping Neighbors one. Uh, and we are excited uh, to have this uh, first uh, Milton Lectureship, and I want to acknowledge uh, our collaborators, uh, Asher Benaria and his team from the Haruv Institute in Jerusalem. Uh, Haruv is both in Jerusalem and also in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And if you wonder how can something be in both Tulsa and Jerusalem, uh, the answer is follow the money. Um, and uh, you can talk more to them about what that really means. But uh, we hope uh, that, we, that as we transmit uh, the impact Gary has had on us uh, uh, through this talk, uh, that you'll get a sense of why we were uh, thrilled to be asked to be the first uh, Melton visiting professors. And the difference in this visiting professorship is there are, there, we, it's insistent that there always be at least two from different disciplines. Uh, and we wanted to sort of model that uh, you shouldn't just bring uh, whoever the uh, expert of the week from your field is to talk to you. So first I have some questions for the audience. And uh, Robert, are you able to tell me the hands up? Uh, how many of the primary care providers uh, who are seeing this screen uh, have in their practice over the years recognized abused or neglected children in their practice? Hands up. Okay, one, two, three. By recognized, I, mean, uh, I don't mean you thought it was, but then didn't do anything about it. Okay, should I ask again? Uh, and how many of you then reported that patient is the second question. What do we, what do we have among the, uh, we have any hands up out there? We have a handful. On a handful. Okay. Um, and those of you who reported, how many of you heard back? What happened to the child or family? Any? You did? Cat, well, you, Kathy, you're not a family physician. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I'm a primary care provider. Never mind. Yeah, you're a special. All right. Uh, now, the next question is, how many of you uh, and on the screen have heard of uh, the ACEs study? All right. There are more hands up uh, on the screen. Some, not so many. Yeah, some. Okay. 
And then the next one is, uh, particularly if you've heard about the ACEs, how many of you ask your adolescent and adult patients specifically if they have been physically, sexually, or emotionally abused during their childhoods as part of your history taken? Frank does that, one does that. Any on the screen? Yes, okay, well, I, I believe you all. Uh, let me move to uh, the history. The, re the, the reason, well, I'll, we'll get into the reason I asked that. Uh, the first national presentation of the battered child syndrome uh, was November 1961 at the American Academy of Pediatrics. I should back up and say that Henry Kemp, who was here, he was recruited as the chair of the Department of Pediatrics when he was a 34-year-old assistant professor at UCSF. Uh, Colorado in those days, the Department of Pediatrics was known as the uh, academic graveyard for professors of pediatrics. Whenever they came, uh, they disappeared uh, from the screen and the rest of pediatrics, most of which was based on the East Coast in what I call the equivalent of the Bermuda Triangle, which is the Baltimore, Boston, Rochester Triangle, where almost all of the uh, medical schools that uh, believe they are the world's best uh, exist. Uh, anyway, Henry came and uh, he described as to how, when he attended on the ward service <clears throat> at Denver General and at Colorado General in those days in 1958, uh, 57 and 58, he was infuriated at uh, how no one would recognize the trauma or neglect of children that he was seeing. Uh, the, the diagnoses he saw were spontaneous subdural hematoma of infancy, uh, osteogenesis imperfecta tarda in a three-year-old child who had never been uh, who had been perfectly well before that. Failure to thrive of unknown etiology uh, was a sign out in a child who came in terribly underweight, gained two to three ounces a day in the hospital uh, in spite of 40 negative lab tests. And it was actually not altruism, but his uh, fury at what he saw as the intellectual dishonesty of all of the physicians and others he was working with. He submitted abstracts to the Society for Pediatric Research in 1959 and 1960 to try to get on the paper, uh, to try to get them, uh, try to get to present the nine cases of battered children that he had put together uh, that appeared in this first uh, article. And it was rejected because uh, he hadn't ruled out uh, genetic or other types of uh, illnesses. And so Henry, who really never let anyone uh, uh, stop him, uh, got himself appointed to be the head of the Scientific Advisory Council of the Academy of Pediatrics, organized as the responsibility, the three-hour session uh, on the battered child in Chicago in 1961, and uh, there were a thousand pediatricians there, some of whom I've talked to uh, who are no longer with us, but have passed on over the years. There was no applause. Some people booed at certain time when statements were made uh, and nearly all of them left and said, not in my practice. Uh, he had in the front row, however, and there's a lesson here for us, a reporter from the Chicago Tribune. Uh, who took notes through the entire three hours. And the next day there was a headline in the Chicago Tribune that said battered children in America. Uh, and the field took off. Uh, the lack of interest by primary care physicians and the, and at the present, uh, and the presence at that time of helpful child welfare agencies uh, led him to believe that unless they implemented mandatory reporting for suspected cases, nobody would deal with the problem. And so in the 1960s, he and his colleague, Brant Steele, visited, I think it was 37 legislatures around the United States and testified to convince them that mandatory reporting of suspected abuse 
was going to be important for all those in health, education, uh, and any other profession that dealt, dealt with children. These statutes require the professionals must report any suspicion, suspicion or reason to believe. They differ from state to state. Uh, physicians don't need to know that abuse has occurred. Um, and in his paper, the assumption was based on the pic he sent pictures to every hospital that had a pediatric service in the United States of battered children and said, how many cases like this did you see last year? The number came back 302. And then he asked district attorneys, how many cases like this did you prosecute? The number came back 447. So if you read that paper, it'll tell you there may have been as many as 749 battered children in the United States in 1960. When mandatory reporting kicked in, that number went to 69,000 in 1970, 680,000 in 1990, uh, 1980, and by 1990, there were 2 million reports, and it's gone up as high as 3 to 4 million reports a year uh, that go uh, to the mandated agencies uh, who don't deal with many of them. The national data on this has been collected on the human services side of HHS. Uh, it is the Children's Bureau uh, uh, and not on, not on any side of the government that knows how to count, uh, but they have been inaccurately collecting data on child abuse for now 45 years. The one thing you could say is they're consistently bad and so maybe you can watch trends, but they're clearly not catching all of the abuse. And I remember talking, uh, I remember hearing Henry say, we know to the ton precisely how many, uh, how much wheat or corn or Hondas or Toyotas come into the country because we collect money on every one of them and you can't get away with a miscount or the government will come after you. But for 50 years, we have estimated somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 children dying of abuse every year, uh, but we don't really know. But it's been the same for 40 to 50 years. When they collect the data, 11% of the reports come from physicians, but they don't break out what kind of physicians, so I couldn't find that data. Now, many people, and Gary was in the lead on this early on, were opposed to mandatory reporting. And as important as it was in the 60s and 70s, by the time Gary and I started having this conversation in the late 80s and 90s, uh, he was pointing out the unintended uh, side effects. He felt that the role of child welfare was and it had been and should be to help families who would voluntarily ask for assistance at times of stress, rather than to become an investigation agency that either substantiates or unsubstantiates cases of abuse and provides little or no help. And over the years, over the late 70s and through the 1980s, the amount of help that actually became available to families who are stressed for whatever reason in this country basically uh, evaporated and disappeared. Now, I disagreed with Gary in 1990 because I, because Henry Kemp told me to. Um, I mean, he didn't tell me to disagree with Gary. He just said mandatory reporting is important. So I said, okay. Um, but it is clear that abuse requires multidisciplinary collaboration. Uh, over the years, what's happened is child welfare has basically said, your job is to report suspicions. We'll take it from here. Uh, and my sense is that has marginalized the rest of us. To the extent professionals in education and healthcare see themselves as their only job being to suspect abuse, and if you suspect it, report it, they'll take care of it. 
I think it, it obviates our role to actually help the children and families that we're seeing. Um, and we're not in that position anymore. And I asked for the first time in 1982, Denver Department of Social Services, of Child Protective Services, because that was the first year I was the child protection team uh, for the Kemp Center. I asked them, I, I saw 100 children for you last year uh, who you asked me whether or not they had been abused. Uh, I'd like to know what happened to them. And they said, we can't tell you, it's confidential. I said, okay, don't tell me by name. I'll send you the list of the hundred children that I saw for you. Why don't we start with you tell me how many are still alive? Well, we don't know. We have no idea. We, how would we know that? From 1981 to now, uh, the system has collected a lot of process data. They can tell you how many cases they open, how many they close, how long it takes to open a case, how long it takes to close a case. Uh, they can tell you how many cases they screen out. But if you ask what actually happened to the children and families, we have no idea. And that's a problem. Yes, a question. Those who were mandatory reporters had questions about um, understanding the role of the professional being a mandatory reporter. What would be reasons they would not choose to take action? Uh, the question is what are reasons that mandatory reporters would choose not to take actions? If you want the official uh, answer, uh, there are none because it's uh, a misdemeanor uh, to fail to report and professionals have been uh, in some places uh, sued and in other places uh, charged with a misdemeanor uh, if they did not report and a case went badly. That said, there have been studies on why don't pediatricians and other people report. Um, one of the reasons is that having rep some having reported and never found out what happened and by reporting, never seeing the family again, decided that that wasn't in the best interests of either them or the child or family. So there are, there are a lot, I think, of physicians practicing civil disobedience. Uh, there are other people who just won't see it. Uh, there, the area of abuse and neglect is one that uh, a British psychiatrist named Kit Ounsted once uh, described as gaze aversion given the opportunity to turn away from the problem and not deal with it, they will always take it. Uh, it's the reason Henry's papers never got accepted by the Society for Pediatric Research. Um, and the, they're in some cases personal risk. So, and if you're in private practice, m many people believe that it doesn't happen in private practice. It only happens in low income uh, and poor neighborhoods. And we know that we know that physical abuse and neglect may be more. Uh, there may be more of it in lower socioeconomic economic groups and poor neighbors. And Jill will talk more about this shortly. Uh, but we also know that sexual abuse has no relationship. And we also know, because having given talks on this for only 30 or 40 years now, when you have a group of adults in the community who you've talked to about this problem, they come up and say, when are you going to actually talk about the most harmful form of abuse? And that's emotional abuse. I spent my life being berated, denigrated, and uh, psychologically destroyed uh, by my fill in the blank, mother, father, stepfather, grandparents, uh, and nobody ever deals with that. And it's true, nobody deals with, it's too prevalent. If we're gonna address emotional abuse, it's, that really has to be a public health and, a, uh, and an almost, uh, it's how do you change the culture in a society and get everybody to buy an iPhone or a Samsung uh, Android, uh, if you're gonna deal with that problem. Hope that answered the question. 
Anyway, uh, so the conf there is also a conflict of interest, uh, I suspect, for many family physicians who have both the parents and the child as their patient. Uh, if one is being abused, there's a potential conflict of interest. I, someone said to me, I guess it was Ash, or somebody said to me this morning, well, what if, is this true about domestic violence as well? Suppose uh, the, uh, the father in your, uh, in your family you're caring for has uh, broken the left arm and left the mother with a black eye. Uh, has anybody addressed that? How, how, when you're caring for the whole family, in an environment that mostly deals with abuse as a criminal offense, how do you actually maintain a caring health relationship with that family and do what we're supposed to do? I, this may be wrong. I'm going to say it. It's going to be part of the, argue, not the discussion that Asher and I have later about mandatory reporting. But I... I think to the extent we've been socialized to think of this as a criminal issue, uh, it has obliterated our ability as health, mental health, and public health professionals to address it in a way that can actually help children and families. Anyway, uh, given your involvement with families long-term and given the family medicine's role in the community, uh, our view is no one is in a better position to provide preventive services. Uh, it's probably especially true for rural family medicine practice. And, you know, as I prepared this, this other aside, I'm doing this a lot, but, uh, but this is an hour and a half, not an hour, which is why I've always wanted to do the Levitt lecture. Um, uh, I don't know how people, how, I don't, I have no idea how family medicine is practiced in 2020. Is everybody employed by a health system? Uh, no. So to the extent people can actually manage their practices, uh, can you build in the time? Now, one of the positive things is this third bullet here, and that is I've watched over the last decade, and a lot of this is work that Frank and all of his colleagues have done over the years to embed behavioral health into family medicine practice so you didn't have to get an appointment at the mental health center uh, to get your emotional issues handled. You could walk down the hall or the doctor would leave the room and somebody else would come in and it could be done right then. In a sense, the F FQHCs have the mental health and social work staff as part of their clinic. But our view is that this probably needs to be expanded and it probably maybe needs to be for a significant part of primary care out in the community. And you can have prevention. Uh, it was years ago that Henry Kemp took a video camera into the delivery room at Colorado General Hospital and videotaped 150 consecutive deliveries and realized that he could identify uh, who was at risk uh, for potential abuse and neglect just by the interaction of the parents with the child at the time of delivery. They also watch for the next couple of days. And they also showed that those who were at risk, if you provide them extra services, help, someone to call when they were stressed, someone who uh, could anticipate what their questions and needs were, they could prevent abuse. That Those papers were published in the 70s. Uh, we routinely at Colorado General Hospital recorded that until we became University of Colorado Hospital and we were no longer Colorado General and I assume people thought, well, we don't see people like that anymore. Uh, and uh, it, it, thank goodness for uh, Mary Cohn, who's been the pediatrician in the nursery for 30 years. She makes those observations herself and tries to uh, do what she can to connect babies at risk with that. But that's something that everyone who attends the delivery, uh, and again, particularly in rural areas, I think family medicine is able to do this. Uh, you can, in fact, provide supportive services uh, and prevent abuse in those families. There have been multiple studies over the years. David Olds, who's here, uh, has randomized controlled trials for 40, 35, 40 year uh, um, 
follow-ups now uh, that his nurse uh, partnership program clearly reduces abuse and has a host of other positive social um, outcomes uh, and Prevent Child Abuse America has Healthy Families America. Each island in Hawaii has uh, home visiting programs. Uh, Henry retired to Hawaii and uh, Cal Sia, who was his friend and colleague, they started all of the programs on the islands years ago. So this kind of support uh, happens around the place. Uh, and the tr truth is there aren't any new parents who can't use some good help. Uh, you can also ask when you're dealing with these, just straight up ask families, have you ever felt angry uh, when your baby wouldn't stop crying? Have you ever felt as if you could hurt your baby? And the question I always love to ask parents, particularly when I saw them uh, at about six months or, or nine months was, uh, tell me when you fell in love with your baby. Um, and, you know, many would say the minute I saw the baby, some would say the minute I felt the first kick, uh, some would say at the moment of conception, uh, I thought maybe they were confusing, uh, 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 but some honestly said and would get teary, you know, it hasn't happened yet. And it's a way to find out how people are actually feeling and what we can do to support them. Because to quote, we don't, I don't have the slide or the picture here, but Kemp's approach, which Gary agreed with, was abusive parents love their children very much, but not very well. And it's our job to help them do it better, not to break apart the family, not to investigate them, but find out, as Brand Steele, who was the psychiatrist who worked with him, said, if you don't understand somebody's behavior, you don't have enough history. So take the time to get the history, understand why that parent is feeling the way he, she or he is, and then do something about it. I'm turning it over now to Jill, because this is slide 11, and Jill <laughs> has 11 through 20. <laughs> and I'm getting to move the slides when she says, can I have the next slide, please? And that's what I started to do in 1970 when I was the chief resident in pediatrics here, showing the slides. Go ahead, Jill. <laughs> Thanks, Dick. So you can all hear me, yes? Yes. Yes, good. You. Okay, but not see me. What? We just can't see your ears. We can't see you here in this room. People on Zoom can see you. Oh, okay. And, and there are just as many people on Zoom as are here. Okay. So um, we're going to um, talk a little bit about the um, role of the family physician in neighborhoods and communities, which is a slight switching of gears, but not really uh, an entire one. So I'd like to ask, and maybe Dick and whoever's looking at the online people uh, can answer the question of how many of you have asked your families about the neighborhood where they live, both about the problems and the positive things in their neighborhoods that impact their families as part of your practice. So this is the for the family physicians Good. and healthcare providers. We, we, we got five hands up here. Five. That's good. What about online? A few. A few. That's less less than a dozen, more than one. Okay. So we're going to spend some time talking about why this um, might be also worthwhile um, to do. And so um, the frame of looking at child maltreatment has evolved over time to encompass more of an ecological perspective on child maltreatment. Years ago, the um, a review that was um, put together by the National Research Council that I was lucky enough to um, participate in, and that was published in 93, so some time ago, 
talked about the need to move from looking at the individual child and parent to looking at really how the family, how the individual and the family was embedded in their neighborhood and embedded in larger society and culture. And so since that time, some progress has been made, good progress has been made in trying to look at the context or community and neighborhood factors that contribute to child maltreatment and that can also be um, used um, in, uh, in prevention. So there is um, um, a fair amount of research that has come about since this review, maybe not entirely due to the review, but um, we can say that we do know something. We may not know everything we wanna know, but we have learned more. Can you go to the next slide? All right. So <clears throat> there's been a significant amount of research, both in the US and internationally, primarily in countries like um, in, in Europe, in Israel, in Australia, that have demonstrated a relationship between child maltreatment reports and neighborhood and community conditions. Uh, these relationships have been of um, two primary kinds. One is that there's been a demonstrated relationship between what are called structural factors in neighborhoods. These are things like uh, poverty, crime, other bad conditions in neighborhoods that you can actually measure using aggregate data that's available in the US at the census tract level. And so this has spurred a significant amount of research in how neighborhood structural factors are associated with child maltreatment reports. So these aggregate analyses have told us um, a lot about the um, associations, but the other kind of uh, neighborhood uh, factor or variable that's important are the process variables. What kind of social supports are there in families? How well do neighbors know one another? Do they get along with one another? And we'll come back um, to more of this when we talk about um, strong um, communities. So from these aggregate analyses, we do know that um, poverty and poor neighborhoods are associated with higher rates of child maltreatment reports. And keep in mind, we're talking about reports that uh, Dick uh, pointed out are um, have their own set of uh, problems and limitations. But we both wanna say very clearly that it's, um, uh, clear that not all poor people and not all individuals who live in poor neighborhoods maltreat their children. And we need to know why. We need to know more about this. There are differences among poor neighborhoods in rates of child maltreatment reports. So you can't just look, for example, at income levels or poverty, but it's a, a complex set of factors. So there are differences among poor neighborhoods in rates of maltreatment reports, there are differences in informal networks, informal helping uh, networks, and there are differences in actual services that are available uh, in neighborhoods. So not all poor neighborhoods are alike in their risks and protections for children. And we need to know more about uh, these neighborhoods and would argue that um, healthcare providers treating these families also need to know something about these neighborhoods. In um, my home city of Cleveland, Ohio, uh, before the well before the pandemic, there's been much more attention lately to uh, disproportionality and disparities in maltreatment reports. But before the pandemic and before more of this increased attention, a life table study of children in Cleveland's neighborhoods showed us that oh. before the age of 10, in some poor and minority neighborhoods, as many as half of children would be subject to a CPS investigation compared to about a little more than a fifth of white children. 
And so we ask, although uh, we don't really know, what does this do to the neighborhood quality and to uh, how life is experienced, how children are reared? Someone uh, this morning mentioned that maybe families want to keep this quite private and not come to attention. And so in these neighborhoods, will primary care uh, be seen as helpful or could it be a risk to the family if they are subject to an investigation? And so this is an important thing to know. And these are the kinds of things you know by talking to people in the community and by doing what um, at least we social scientists call mixed methods research, where you look at both the aggregate data and see where the problems seem to be more prevalent and also do a qualitative look. It's important, um, we also wanna add, to have the views of uh, both adults and children. And I know if um, Asher, you're there, to have spent a lot of time promoting um, this um, view. And so the views of both adults and children are important to understanding as a family um, healthcare provider, really what's going on in the context around them that can affect things um, from maltreatment um, to sleep, to all kinds of health related issues. And so in the next slide, this is from uh, Jim Spilsbury's uh, dissertation research. He's a neighborhood and a sleep researcher um, also at, at Case. And so he asked uh, parents and children what their neighborhood boundaries were, thinking if they lived in the same household, that parents and their children would at least agree on where children could go on their own. And you can see from uh, this uh, one graphic that at least in the one family we're using as an example here, the parents' neighborhood boundaries were far different from the child, the parents in yellow, the child in red, and that this dark blue area is a, is a very small agreed upon range where children could go with a friend or without being uh, supervised by their uh, parents. And so without talking to um, both the child and the adult, we would have little way of knowing. And then um, the next slide is just another example or another caution on these multiple perspectives. As someone caring for a family, you'd want to know what the positives and negatives were uh, in uh, people's neighborhoods. And we asked about dangers in the neighborhood. Not surprisingly, uh, in um, many of these poor neighborhoods with high rates of drugs and alcohol, the parents overwhelmingly mentioned drugs as something they were worried about for their children, that they were worried that this would pose a significant risk even to their very young children. Children didn't mention this. They did not mention drugs or drug dealers or any concern. They very rarely mentioned this, but what they mentioned was dogs. They were afraid of dogs in their neighborhoods who are often trained to protect the households and can be um, quite vicious. So on the one hand, um, you might say, well, dogs are behind fences or this is just a child's view, but for children negotiating their neighborhoods and seeking help, it, it might be important to know that they were not so concerned that they would stumble into a drug house, but they were very concerned about um, dogs. We also um, asked, or Jim asked, um, which neighbors um, children could go to for help. And we often think about when we're talking with uh, children um, and getting their views, that they're uh, passive and grateful recipients of help, that we should just offer help and they will take it. And talking to children, you find actually that they hear the message of strangers being dangerous and they view adult offers of help with a bit of uh, caution or skepticism. So they had indeed um, a hierarchy. 
And they would say they wanted someone they knew, man, woman, just someone that they knew. And pressed a little further, they said, well, really better if it's a woman, because maybe she's a mother and it's preferable you have a mother. And uh, even more so, um, if you can find a mother with a stroller, then there's no doubt that this is, um, this is a safe person to go to uh, for uh, help. So um, these are some things you can um, ask about in uh, children's uh, uh, neighborhoods and um, try and get a sense of what families are trying to deal with in negotiating these factors that impinge upon parent-child relations and on uh, child and family well-being. So we wanted um, to mention um, also, because uh, we wanna talk a bit about uh, Gary Melton's strong communities, that there are different uh, approaches to um, community and neighborhood-based programs that healthcare providers could and do come in contact with. Um, one approach are uh, community-based programs that are aimed primarily at individuals and families. Um, Jill McClay talked about this in uh, her talk yesterday. And so that there are around um, uh, the country and uh, Dick also mentioned some either now or this morning, we're doing multiple talks here, but at some point um, mentioned that there are many of these programs that use home visiting to connect families with preventive services, um, while also um, working to increase these services and access to them in communities. And there's good evidence that this works that this reduces child abuse and that this increases well-being. The other approach that we're gonna talk about um, more um, tomorrow is this very innovative and important approach that uh, Gary took called Strong Communities. And this was, um, when you look at all of the uh, programs that exist, this was really innovative and uh, brave and um, courageous in saying, well, let's see if we can change the community to make this a better place for children. So rather than only um, working with individuals, because you can do that too, let's go to the community and make a concerted effort to uh, improve the conditions in the community that will promote child well being and prevent child abuse. So, we're going to talk about strong communities more tomorrow. And Jill McLay talked about it um, uh, extensively yesterday. But strong communities um, used uh, community resource specialists, had thousands of volunteers promoting uh, child well being and resources and care for children. It improved neighborhood conditions, showed reductions in child maltreatment reports compared to uh, comparison communities. And as Jill pointed out, um, and um, Asher ben Arie, who I think is also in the audience, I can't see you either, um, uh, worked on uh, much of this uh, data, um, showed that, you, that strong communities actually could make changes. And so, uh, Dick and I, in our discussions, we'll talk more about strong um, communities tomorrow. Um, um, want to really, you know, not lose a track of this uh, important idea that we can change the context in which families live or uh, with their uh, children. So we're going to slightly switch. Uh, topics slightly a bit, but not completely. And we're going to talk about um, the idea of um, risk and protective factors and ACEs as something that healthcare uh, providers and others can look at in bridging 
uh, the individual and the uh, community. And the website is here for those of you who want to look. And individual and risk factors have been uh, largely approached or have been approached to this idea of adverse childhood experiences that has received the bulk of the attention. Um, in the question we asked at the beginning of this uh, part of our talk, how many of you have asked about your neighborhood or community? Uh, the CDC also talks about community risk factors. I'm gonna show you some of these and also talks about protective or compensating factors, both at the individual and the uh, community level. So we wanted to, in the next slide, uh, thank you, um, just briefly uh, show what, um, what we're talking about in um, ACEs or adverse childhood experiences that are linked to later illness and difficulties. I can't remember how many people raised their hand that they knew about ACEs. Fair amount. Fair amount. Okay. So I won't um, uh, necessarily uh, belabor the point, but when Felitti was working in, um, in a clinic with uh, treating obesity, he came to realize that many of the problems of one particular woman and then others were grounded in her childhood experiences of abuse. And so with a very large sample, he looked at these uh, 10 ACEs or adverse child experiences and was able to link them convincingly to later health and social problems. So he looked at emotional, physical, and sexual uh, abuse. He looked at neglect emotional and physical, and he looked at various household uh, dysfunctions, whether the mother was treated violently, or whether there was household substance abuse, household mental illness, uh, parental separation or divorce, and whether a household member had in fact been incarcerated. So on the next slide, um, questions arose as to, were there really counter ACEs? And uh, CDC links these, as does uh, the paper I'm referring to here, where in addition to asking about these adverse child experiences, there are positive experiences. And this is one area where we could do um, uh, a better job in trying to see what the balance of these, what we've called for a long time, risk and protective uh, factors um, are. So in the um, interest of uh, leaving a little bit of um, time for discussion after I finish my turn and uh, Dick has another turn, let me just briefly say that these counter ACEs, as you can see, asked about um, significant others. Were there caregivers or teachers or another adult who cared about you, who did things with you, who gave you opportunities? Did you have uh, predictable routines? Did you have friends? Uh, did you like school? And so uh, some researchers now are looking at these to see what the um, counterbalance might be. The CDC in the next slide, next slide, there we are, also um, um, looked at community risk factors. And this is some of what I was talking about in um, a few minutes ago, both in terms of things you can tell from aggregate data about communities, structural factors, such as high rates of violence, crime, poverty, um, uh, unemployment rates, um, drug and alcohol outlets that are in the community, and that you can also look at in terms of neighborhood processes where um, how families perceive and uh, get along in their neighborhoods. The CDC also um, in uh, the next slide 
um, much as the counter uh, counter aces um, uh, at the individual level did, look at where their protective factors are. Do families feel like they have access to safe after school places? Do they feel like they have opportunities? Do they uh, engage in uh, trust with one another as Rob Sampson's work has shown on collective efficacy? And so as we um, look at um, neighborhood conditions, there are um, these ways of looking at risk and protective factors that um, uh, in looking at child maltreatment and healthcare providers roles that um, we can also access in different ways and use to improve conditions in neighborhoods, keeping in mind Gary's idea of uh, strong communities and building a better place for children and families. And now I believe it's Dick's turn again. I have, I'm coming back for the quick wrap up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been struck by uh, the differences and <clears throat> why I'm looking toward family medicine for help here is my experience has been that internists aren't interested in this area. Uh, they, I, uh, for, for them, going back in the history to why was it again you made this appointment yesterday is about as far back as uh, I've experienced from a lot of people. And, 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 and I attended a, a, a grand rounds uh, run by one of our colleagues at this school who I've uh, valued for, for years, who went through a whole lecture on social determinants of health for uh, cardiologists and never uh, mentioned abuse and neglect or ACEs or anything else. And I asked him afterward, have you ever heard of the ACEs study? And <clears throat> he said, no. Uh, and it, what struck, what's striking is that the data are clear, not just from ACEs, but lots of other people now that if you've experienced these particularly very five different forms of abuse, there are physical health impacts, there's more chronic disease. Uh, there's a lot of work that Shankoff and others uh, at Harvard have done on the impact of maltreatment on the infant brain and the developing brain and how it literally changes, how the environment and children's uh, cortisol responses uh, drive uh, different types of, uh, of uh, synapses and connecting. And, and this is 24 years later, still a mystery to people. And it makes one wonder, particularly if you're in an institution called a medical school or a health sciences campus, where you're supposed to be educating people uh, about how narrow we've gotten and how we only read our own journals. Uh, and if stuff doesn't cross over, how would you know uh, unless you heard this stuff? So, uh, and, and Felitti and in the ACEs study uh, is part of it. And I, I, one of his articles, uh, come, I'll have the reference at the end, uh, he was giving a talk at the at an internal medicine society meeting in California. He said, what does it mean that early sexual abuse is never spoken of uh, in medical practice? We find it useful routinely to ask all patients acknowledging this experience, how did that affect you later in life? Uh, and then he says, what then is a woman's diagnosis who has obesity, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes? Is she just another overweight, hypertensive, diabetic old woman, or is there more to the practice of medicine? And here's the way he conceptualized that problem. Their diagnosis is childhood sexual abuse. Under that is depression. 
under that is morbid obesity with the side effects of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and coronary artery disease. And by the way, this person also had macular degeneration and psoriasis. And he said, this is not a comfortable diagnostic formulation, but it points out that our attention is comfortably focused on the tertiary consequences far downstream. The diagnosis shows that the primary issues are well protected by social convention and taboo and points out that we have limited ourselves to the smallest part of the problem. The part where we're comfortable is mere prescribers of medication. Which diagnostic choice shall we make? Who shall make it? And if not now, when? He said this in 2002. It's uh, the 20th anniversary uh, of this work. And you gotta wonder, uh, when are we going to be uh, addressing this? Uh, and what, in fact, if we're gonna do that, would Gary want us to do? Uh, and for Jill and me, uh, it means working across all parts and sectors of the community. Uh, it means basing services in the community, advocating uh, to end, or at least if we're not gonna end it, make sure we test it to make sure that it's working well compared to the alternative uh, mandatory reporting and improve the uh, community conditions and social conditions for children and families uh, in the community. And therein endeth uh, <laughs> the lecture. Thank you. We have, we have a couple of questions on the chat. The first one is children with a disability are significantly vulnerable to abuse throughout the lifespan. Do you have any statistics regarding this population? And do you see this population as a high priority for policy change? Okay, so I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question was, children with disabilities are at a higher risk of abuse. Children and adults with disabilities are at a higher risk of abuse throughout their lifespan. Do we uh, have any data on that and any suggestions? Uh, there are data, it's, uh, it's at least, and, and actually, uh, I suppose we're not supposed to have advertisement, but in the second edition of uh, the Handbook of Child Maltreatment that uh, Jill and I edited, there's a, a chapter by, uh, uh, I think it's Gordino, uh, Angelo Gordino is chair of pediatrics at uh, Utah, uh, has worked in this area for years. Children with disabilities have at least are at least 10 percent higher risk of abuse than children without disabilities. Uh, that's the number I remember from uh, from that chapter. And uh, I I wouldn't separate that uh, out, but I do think that the principles are the same. Uh, parents and or caretakers if the children are in uh, institutional settings uh, are clearly uh, more prone to becoming frustrated and stressed and they need the same kind of help and services and intervention uh, that any family uh, uh, who's at risk for abuse needs. So, uh, and, the and if, you've got if you've got these children in your practice, uh, helping make sure that the caretakers have extra services is important. And the second question is? The second question is, does strong communities have a rating, if any, EDP clearinghouse? Uh, does strong communities have a rating and an EBP clearinghouse? Uh, is the answer to that yes? yes. Someone said yes. The answer is yes. Three. Three. Uh, I'm I'm glad you answered that question. Yes, I I want to tell you though uh, how frustrated I am with uh, waiting for all of the evidence. Um, you, you know, we've known home visitation and support works for 50 years. Uh, how many randomized trials do we need? If in fact the health system would take this up. 
we all now in healthcare look at the quality and outcomes of our practice. And if our, our little home visiting team within our practice or our uh, FQHC or in our hospital isn't doing what it should do, we ought to be able to figure that out pretty quickly and change it and make it better. We don't have to wait for the United States Preventive Services Task Force uh, to be convinced. Sometimes just perfect is the enemy of good. Actually, a lot. Jill, you got anything to add here? I'm... Good answer. Good answer. Yes, uh, another one, Dr. IQ. Yeah. This is from uh, Ron Mitchell, CapSec. He asks, have ACEs outcomes changed today compared to when the research was first occurred? And whether it has or not, why do you believe this is the case? Has, ACE, have the, has ACEs outcomes changed over the 20 years? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I think the problem isn't, well, uh, maybe I should say this. If you look at everybody, there are a lot of people trying to get on the adverse child experiences boat. Um, and some of them have modified uh, the original 10 that Felitti had uh, and have added some. And I've, I've even seen a graph. We have the graphs. It's some, I don't remember where I saw it. Uh, I, I was talking with Jill McClee about this. When, you've, when you review and edit journals, you never remember whether what you're about to quote is actually in print and real or rejected. Uh, but you were impressed by it anyway, uh, even if the other two reviewers weren't. Uh, but, but there are people who will show a tree uh, with all of the community and all of the individual adverse experiences that can happen to families. I don't know. I, I, you know, sorry, Ron, I don't know the answer to that question. Jill, do you know the answer to that question? I don't know it any better than you do. That was a good answer. The preceding was a paid political announcement. <laughs> okay, that's it. Anything here? Yes, Don. Thinking about Jill's work in the the same kids. Maybe I could bring you a mic. Thanks. This work? It works. It Uh, just in Jill's work in the showing that in communities of poverty where uh, rates of child abuse are higher, thinking about some of the communities that I work with where, you know, those rates of poverty are also probably associated with parents who have experienced hiaces themselves. And so there's a lot of mistrust um, kind of built into their worldview. Um, they've probably, uh, their experience of childhood was of, of or how they learned parenting was abusive um, and that sort of thing. So, where, so I, I guess what I'm thinking is it's not just the poverty that's there, it's the fact that these, these parents have a lot of stresses from their own childhood ACEs. Um, and then thinking about something like the strong communities that that becomes a barrier to adopting some of the, the strong community practices maybe. I'm just wondering, uh, Jill, your thoughts on on kind of the compounding of all those factors. Okay. Yeah, I. I. I okay, go ahead, ahead, Jill. No, go ahead. No, go no, ahead. no. I have nothing to say. I was going to oh. punt. Oh. <laughs> so yes, I think I can't see you, but I think that you know that's that's a good point. As is the question about whether people in poor communities are subjected to more scrutiny. There's an ongoing debate. Is it scrutiny or is it uh, stress? But in the way, if, if I'm understanding the second part of your uh, uh, question, in the way that strong communities works and um, Robin or Carmeet or Jill may want to weigh in also, um, is that um, help is offered without stigma and without um, judgment, it's just help. And so one of the advantages that I think uh, Gary saw in this approach is that you didn't have to be labeled before you could um, get help or before you would be embedded or embraced 
um, in uh, this larger um, community, if I'm understanding your uh, your question correctly. So there are questions in the literature about whether what the association with poverty means and what it means with concentrated poverty in particular and other, um, none of the neighborhood analyses really stop at just poverty. It includes other factors like employment rates and crime and you know other negative um, aspects. But I think that your point about this is, you know, they're bringing, uh, people bring their parenting um, with them to their communities is is a, a good thing to keep in mind. So thank you for that comment. Yes. Hi. Um, one of the things you notice when you work in a large system that has many different silos is how oftentimes problems that affect a family are addressed differently in different areas. And certainly one of the things I notice is in also working with women who are victims of intimate partner violence and children who are, you know, at Denver Health, uh, we have the safe center. Um, and we've also had a relationship with the Rose Andam Center that's a family justice center. So I'm struck at how separate those two organizations are or those two that sort of advocacy groups are when it seems to me looking from a family perspective that there's a very high chance that you're dealing with the same families or uh, there's a tremendous amount of overlap. So I just wondered if either of you who've been working in this field for a long time have any insight as well, to the nature of that and whether we should look at it in a different way. I think uh, whether you call them silos or the balkanization of uh, people who do work in child abuse in domestic violence, uh, now in elder abuse, uh, and even within the child abuse field uh, is striking. And it depends uh, if, if people come from different perspectives. Those of us here and the Kemp Center in general and people who trained here with Henry and others come from this perspective that this is an issue we need to recognize, address, and because Brant Steele took the time to talk to all of the abusers, he knew what they went through as children that led to the behavior. None of this was surprising. And he said, if you don't understand somebody's behavior, you don't have enough history. Uh, the domestic violence group uh, basically comes at this from a criminal perspective. And by the way, you will hear if you go to Huntsville, Alabama, that the multidisciplinary approach to child abuse and neglect was started by Bud Kramer, who was the district attorney uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, and started what are now the community, the child advocacy centers that have a multidisciplinary approach to evaluating sexually abused children for prosecutors. Okay, they are just recently, after 30 years, getting involved in some treatment. Um, the most interesting experience I had a long time ago was in the 19, early 90s, being asked to talk at a domestic violence national conference uh, and uh, being booed when I said, uh, if you really want to talk about the prevention of uh, men who batter women, we need to identify the five to 10 year olds in our population who are the reservoir of that population in the future and get them help now. And I was booed because nobody wanted to prevent the men from beating the women. They just wanted to punish the men for beating the women. But all you have to do is walk around a nursery uh, in any of our hospitals and look at every one of those 40 newborns and think to yourself, I wonder who's going to be the sex offender here. Or I wonder who's going to be the Nobel laureate. Um, and all of that is an open book. And to the extent that we don't have a way of intervening early, uh, Lori Poland talks about this all the time because she knows that the 22 year old, 23 year old who kidnapped her was once a three year old 
on a cul-de-sac in Littleton, Colorado, who didn't want to go home because he was being abused there by his brothers. And if uh, <clears throat> he had gotten help when he was three and four, she wouldn't have gone through what she and a dozen, more than a dozen, dozens of other women now have identified him as someone who abused them as well with her story being public. So we, we've got to get earlier and we've got to maintain the perspective that none of this starts de novo at age 21. It just doesn't bubble up. Somebody doesn't decide, okay, I'm done with college. I guess I'll take the sex offender track for a job. <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay. Another one. Another one. It is, and the time is right, too. Jeff Seymour from uh, one of our colleagues, Family Medicine, says she sees a lot of her physician colleagues experiencing burnout related to the fact that they know what to ask and what to do, and they just simply don't have the time to address right. the issues in the primary care settings. She asks, what can we do to create primary care practice environments that will support PCP to do this extremely important work? Uh, that's uh, hello. First, I'll say hello, Deb. Nice to hear from you. I'm glad you are here. Um, I, you know, we 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 need to have a. It's a it's another hour. It's a completely different approach. And I, I'll just give you an example. I, I you if you're going to be practicing in a clinical environment within something called Kaiser Permanente or UC Health or any other system you will not be able to do this effectively, in my view, because you will have 20 minutes uh, if you're lucky, uh, and you may or may not have the support. I, you may have more time in an FQHC, I don't know. But I think you have to embed the primary care in uh, family resource centers in the communities where the families are, and the physicians need to be there to be able to have the conversations when they can. The, the current reimbursement environment and the current way health is structured, it's like what, it's what Felitti put up in his diagnosis. If you start with chronic, chronic sexual abuse uh, or childhood sexual abuse, that's not gonna be a 20 minute visit where all you have to do is uh, look at the head, ears, eyes, nose, throat, uh, examine a couple of things and hit the road. Uh, it, it's got to be a different model. And in fact, we started when when we started uh, NCAN, my last comment on this, we, we don't want to be a foundation that does what everybody's been doing for 50 years because it hasn't worked. So we asked for what we called were disruption papers. Suppose we were starting over, and it's not a bad thing to ask for primary. I think the Academy's primary care study maybe did this, Larry. I, I read it, but it, if we were starting over and designing how to provide primary care to families or how to deal with child abuse as a society, start over knowing everything we know now, how would we support the research to support it, train the people to do it, uh, and then create the prevention and treatment models that can succeed. Because there's nothing within the current environment that is demonstrated that it can do it effectively. So family medicine, if, to the extent family medicine training has its residents in hospital and clinic settings with role models who are part of this system, they'll never do it. They won't. And to the extent that the uh, accreditation of residencies is kind of like the ELSIME and everything else where they've become uh, ossified over the past uh, 40 years, uh, you'll never get people trained the right way. So it, I said, I said it this morning. We have to take the approach Henry Silver took when he was looking at primary care 50 years ago. Well, he said pediatricians aren't going to do primary care. 
maybe I can get the nurses who've been working in pediatric offices, give them a few more skills and they can handle 90% of it. And by the way, they could. So maybe we need to look at other models to actually be able to create the workforce to actually address the problems you're talking about. The time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, that clock says it's 12.30. Nobody should change it until November. Okay, Jill, say something. Something, thank you all very much for coming. Get in, get in touch with us if you want. <laughs>